So, uh, welcome to the tenth episode of Franklin, the City Skyline series with a very inconsistent upload schedule. Uh, it's about 1836 in Franklin, and today we're going to talk about law and order. Oh, okay, so in City Skylines, law and order... Is it going to do that every time? So, so it's very simple in the game. Uh, you build some police stations, and the police go around and patrol cars, and they catch burglars, and then they send them to jail. Uh, you know, crime increases proportionally to unemployment and low education rates, and you can enact some policies that deter crime, like harsh prison sentences. And, uh, you know, after the Sims get out of jail, they go on to live healthy and productive lives as reformed members of society. So, some of this is not strictly wrong, but it's definitely not taken as a whole a very great approximation of the actual function of police, prisons, and the justice system in uh, modern society, right? Uh, the idea that education reduces crime has been baked into city simulators since, I think, at least SimCity 2000. The idea that you can alter prison sentences is new, I think, but deterrence via harsh punishment is questionably effective policy in real life, uh, to say the least. So, in order to understand how this works better in real life, we're going to talk about law and order. <laughs> More specifically, in this episode, we're going to talk about prisons, uh, prison architecture, and architecture as a method of social control. Now, because this episode is set in 1836, we're not really going to talk about policing, which barely existed in America at this time. That'll come in some future episode. And also, I'm doing a time lapse of creating the Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, asset rather than doing a build because the build for this episode was very short. So here's sort of a brief history of the law and uh, imprisonment as a punishment. So we'll start with Sargon of Akkad. No, not that guy. No, not that guy either. We're talking about the real guy. So he unified the Mesopotamian city-states, and from his uh, successor, we have the first surviving legal code, the Code of Ur-Nammu from around 2100 BC. The, the big one everyone remembers, though, is the Code of Hammurabi, which was 300 years later or so. Uh, so the Code of Hammurabi starts out by enshrining equality in the preamble, and then immediately ignores that by enshrining three separate classes into law, including slaves, and punishments for infractions, of course, uh, varied based on your social class. And a lot of stuff was punishable by death or mutilation. Uh, is you know, mostly all that sort of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth stuff, or uh, lex talionis, if you want to be fancy and use Latin. Uh... You know, and this also included some fine for monetary damages uh, payable to the owner of the property you damaged. Okay, so Lex Talionis was uh, the basis for a lot of ancient legal codes, including in the Old Testament, of course. Uh, the ancient Greeks, though, contributed a new concept, which was imprisonment. So the Athenians would imprison anyone who couldn't pay a fine until they could pay the fine. But, of course, this meant that for large fines, it was effectively life imprisonment. So the Athenians were the first to introduce fixed-length prison sentences. Uh, the Romans took it a step further, and they enshrined prison sentences as punishment for the first time. But you were more likely to be uh, sentenced to forced labor on public works than thrown in a prison. Um... Now, the Romans opened some of the first uh, purpose-built prisons. The most famous of this was the Mamertine, which was uh, literally built inside of a sewer. Uh, this was mostly used as a sort of death row. Uh, folks weren't really kept there long term. Oh, okay, so we'll skip forward a bit here. Uh, the Magna Carta happened in 1215, and that's where we get habeas corpus, which is protection against unlawful confinement. And it'll fast forward even more to 1700s Britain. And imprisonment is still somewhat uncommon as a punishment. 
the British instead preferred to just murder you, right? There were 300 capital offenses in the British legal code uh, at this point, ranging from murder to arson to petty theft. Now, for some lesser offenses, you could be sentenced to the stocks or maybe whipped. But for the vast majority of crimes, you went straight to the gallows. Though sometimes, if you were lucky, you were transported to the colonies instead of being hanged. In the American colonies, though, the precise legal codes tended to differ widely. They were generally stricter and more punitive in the Puritan North and somewhat more lenient in the South. And these codes had, you know, varying degrees of success. Uh, so what we're going to say here in Franklin, in Pennsylvania, history closely tracked uh, the real Pennsylvania. So in 1718, the British legal code was adopted outright, replacing a much more lenient Quaker-inspired legal code. So there was little need for prisons or jails beyond debtors' prisons, as the hangman took care of most punishment, right? Um, but after the Revolution, there's a general feeling that the British method of applying capital punishment for almost every offense was kind of outdated, you know, kind of monarchist, and really just bad, you know, when we had these new humanist, enlightenment, liberal, democratic ideas that were coming out now. So that left us a question, which is, what do you do in lieu of capital punishment? Prison, the clink, the big house the joint, the jail, the hole, so on and so forth. So this requires a lot more physical infrastructure than just a set of gallows, right? So the first large purpose-built prisons were constructed. Uh, the most famous of these early prisons uh, in the United States was the Walnut Street Jail in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this one. Uh, it was, you know, your old-fashioned kind of prison that was basically modeled on a dungeon. You put a bunch of people in a room, and that's about the end of it. So, you know, you had criminals, you had debtors, you had people awaiting trial. You know, all, everyone was held in the same room. And, and it's not a, not, not a great system, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, people are maybe intermingling a bit more than they should be. Uh, it's difficult to control all these folks as a group. And, uh, you know, of course... Everyone was drunk all the time because it was really easy to smuggle contraband in. Uh, so some efforts were made to create newer and more advanced prison designs which could alleviate some of the miseries associated with life in prison. Okay, so here we are. Experimental prison designs, right? This is where you want me to talk about the Panopticon and Michel Foucault, right? Oh, that's where you're wrong, kiddo. Let's get out the projector. It's time to talk about some sophisticated architecture type stuff. You see, Michel Foucault wasn't around in 1836. He didn't talk about the Panopticon until 1975. And furthermore, I haven't read Discipline and Punish. What we can instead talk about are contemporary ideas which influenced the Panopticon and how they influenced the construction of some actual prisons. Uh, we're going to meander a bit to get there, but trust me, this is all leading to a point. So, let's get on to the pantheon of dead white male architects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we got to go back to Giovanni Battista Piranese. Uh, he was famous for his sketches of Roman ruins back in 1745-ish, when the Grand Tour was still, you know, the rite of passage for the upper classes of Europe. Uh... He did a set, series of sketches also called the Carceri, next slide please, which were entirely fictional prisons and dungeons, uh, some of which had some bizarre non-Euclidean geometry. Now, obviously with the design of these prisons being impossible to construct in real life, they weren't a huge influence on prison design, but, you know, these sketches, along with the sketches of Rome, were a huge influence on the French neoclassicists. Next slide, please. Uh, Piranese's sketches represented a break from the previous Baroque style. Uh, Baroque artists and architects studying the ruins depicted them in a sort of romanticized and idealized way, but uh, Piranese depicted the ruins as they were, which was, you know, surrounded by drunks and beggars. Uh, next slide, please. 
also with the rediscovery of the Roman city of Pompeii in 1748 and the discovery and proliferation of knowledge of actual structures of the Roman Empire uh, outside of Rome, a movement we now know as neoclassicism arose. All right, so a, a lot of people will call any old ornamented building neoclassical, but what we're talking about here is a very specific movement which originated in France in the mid-1600s during the reign of Louis XIV. Next slide, please. So capital N neoclassicism is generally differentiated from earlier Baroque architecture by its simpler geometric forms and more restrained ornamentation. And these features particularly stood out with some of the visionary architecture produced in that period. Uh, later, the Beaux-Arts style evolves out of neoclassicism, which takes advantage of newer materials available in the 1800s. Okay, next slide, please. I'm going to skip over the first 75 years of neoclassicism and talk about this French guy, Claude Nicolas Ledoux. Next slide, please. Uh, so he's famous for a few buildings, one of which is the Rotan de uh, Villettes. Villette, I, I don't know French. Uh, essentially, it was a big toll booth, uh, one of 62 toll booths, which were also all designed by Ledoux, and a new wall that surrounded Paris uh, to extract taxes for the uh, Ferme Générale. I hope that's how you pronounce that. Uh, City Skylines Modder uh, Jez made a model of it. You can go to that, get that on the Steam Workshop. Uh, next slide, please. But what we're going to talk about uh, here is the Royal Salt Works at Arc et Senans. Uh, now, this was built in 1778, just a few years before Jeremy Bentham came up with the Panopticon. So, this was basically an industrial plant designed to make salt for export. It's an early mass production facility, more sort of uh, industrial mercantilism rather than uh, industrial capitalism, because this uh, facility was owned and operated by the state for the spake of uh, exporting only. Now, the basic plan here, uh, next slide please, was a, a big semicircle, right? The director of the salt works lived in the center, the salt works themselves were along the flat side of the semicircle, and the workers lived along the circumference. This was eventually intended to form part of the core of an ideal city, which we'll get to in a second. Now, the idea here wasn't necessarily uh, directly about surveillance, right? These are workers, not prisoners. But obviously the director of the salt works could watch the whole site at any time, and I guess he could yell at any lollygaggers. Uh, next slide, please. So Claude Ledoux became associated with the phrase architecture parlant, or architecture speaks. The idea here being that buildings should look like uh, what they're intended to do or somehow convey their function through their architecture. Uh, this was shown through Ledoux's utopian town of Chaux, that's uh, C-H-E-A-U-X, because uh, French, uh, in, which was intended to surround the salt works. So, for instance, the entrance to the salt works was supposed to look like a salt mine, houses for the coopers looked like barrels, and so on and so forth. Now, some of Ledoux's utopian visions were a little bit unorthodox. For instance, he was the first man in history, at least that I know of, to consider the plight of the involuntarily celibate. He designed a state-owned and operated brothel for a show. It's where disaffected young upper-class men could go pick up their state-issued girlfriend. Yeah, none, of, none of this incel stuff is new. Here's what it looked like. It's a penis, you see. Architecture parlant. Uh, so... This was visionary architecture even at the time, and despite the fact that these buildings only ever existed on paper or in renders, uh, visionary architecture was pretty influential. Uh, next slide, please. Like uh, this design for a library by another French guy, Etienne Louis Boulet. Now, the nice thing about visionary architecture, of course, is that it doesn't have to make sense. You know, like, say, 
a barrel vault where the keystone has been removed for most of its length, or a library with a big hole in the roof. So Boulay dealt largely in visionary architecture. Uh, next slide, please. Which was designed to provoke feelings of the sublime. So that's like that, you know, feeling of, oh my God, this is so incredible. When you see a great art or listen to great music or whatever, or, you know, when you do a lot of drugs. Um, so, for instance, this was designed for a cemetery entrance. Next slide, please. Uh, Boulay worked with sheer scale to generate feelings of the sublime and generally didn't concern himself with petty issues like, how would you even build this thing? You know, instead he just uh, drew a picture of a big chungus. Next slide, please. His first, most famous and influential big chungus was his design for a cenotaph for Sir Isaac Newton, which was to be a 500-foot-tall hollow sphere that's bigger than the Great Pyramid at Giza. Uh, a cenotaph is a funerary monument for someone who's buried somewhere else. I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, so the French Revolution happened. Uh, Ledoux, who was associated with the harsh taxation imposed by the Ferme General through his toll booths, was spared the guillotine but spent a lot of time in prison, and he never really worked again. Uh, I don't think the revolutionaries really concerned themselves with Boulay. Uh, meanwhile, a whole bunch of French aristocrats fled to Russia during the revolution. Next slide, please. And neoclassical architecture and many of its ideas fled with them. Uh, now, there are plenty of compromises in Russian neoclassicism, of course. Uh, this is the Austin Kino Palace north of Moscow. Uh, while it's decorated to look like stone, this building is in fact entirely made of wood. Uh, next slide, please. In the meantime, neoclassicism also starts to take over in Britain, where it's called Palladianism, named after Andrea Palladio, who wrote the four books of architecture, which were translated into English, and that's what set off the Palladian craze in England. So, where are we going with this? So there were these two brothers, uh, Samuel and Jeremy Bentham, who were both Englishmen working on industrial projects in Russia in 1786. Uh, Samuel was an engineer, Jeremy was a philosopher. Both of them would have been educated in the latest architectural theories and styles of the era, and between them they developed an experimental prison called the Panopticon. Next slide, please. Right, so the idea behind the Panopticon is pretty simple. If you're in a cell, you can't see the guards, but the guards can see you. You can't tell if you're being watched, so you'll be on your best behavior all the time. Now, this is achieved with a circular plan similar to Ledoux's salt works uh, with the central guard tower, right? It's basically designed to grind down its inmates into having good behavior and civic virtue and blah, blah, blah. So Jeremy Bentham spends a lot of time trying to get a panopticon built uh, in revolutionary France and in Ireland, uh, fails miserably, right? Eventually one does get built in Cuba in 1926. He's pretty dead by then. Um, but panopticon-like features find their way into actual buildings uh, fairly quickly, though. And uh, Jeremy Bentham's marketing of the idea solidified it in the discourse of high society. And, uh, of course, there were plenty of contemporary or contemporary-ish critics of the idea of the Panopticon. Uh, next slide, please. One of them was Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin. Okay, so this, this guy's a character, right? I hope I get to talk about him more at some point. His entire shtick was that neoclassical architecture was pagan and therefore bad, and he wanted to bring back Gothic architecture, which was Christian and good, and that would bring back moral and Christian behavior to Britain. So he's most famous for designing the interior of this and designing this. So this is not called Big Ben, by the way. Big Ben is the bell. This is the Elizabeth Tower, or sometimes it's called St. Stephen's Tower. Anyway, next slide, please. So his famous book, Contrasts, has a simple concept. Pugin does a sketch of a new thing and explains why it is bad, and then below it he sketches an old thing and he explains why it's good. 
And this is the sort of thing I feel an immediate kinship with. I, I feel like if Pugin lived today, he'd be a really high-level poster on uh, traditional Catholic Twitter. Uh, but one of these images was of a Panopticon-style workhouse contrasted with a Christian monastery dedicated to helping the poor. So, once again, new equals bad, old equals good. Okay, so I summed up about a hundred years of the neoclassical period of architecture right there uh, across several countries, and it's important to remember that none of what I mentioned is necessarily a direct influence on any other person or thing, but I, it's good to get a, a sense of the mood of the era, right? Folks were attempting to use architecture in new and innovative ways to control and alter the social behavior of human beings, both in and out of prison, with varying degrees of success. Okay, next slide, please. So this is John Haviland. Uh, he was educated in architecture in England, uh, of course studying the latest trends in neoclassicism, or Palladianism as he would have known it, and uh, he traveled to Russia to find work with the Imperial Corps of Engineers in 1815. Now, he did not get that job. Instead, he met John Quincy Adams, who convinced him to move to Philadelphia, and after a very short time, he got the commission for the largest and most expensive building in the new nation, Eastern State Penitentiary. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about the outside and its architecture, and then we're going to talk about the inside and how the prison worked. So the first thing you should notice is that this building is clearly built in the Gothic style. That's the one with the pointy windows. Uh, so, you ask, why take me through all that garbage about neoclassicism to show me a Gothic building? And I did that for two reasons. Number one is that the dick-shaped building is funny. Number two is that Haviland designed a building which, while gothic in style, is neoclassical in scale, neoclassical in proportions, and neoclassical in ornamentation. Uh, next slide, please. So, for instance, the guard towers are enormous, uh, they're very simple in their shape, and they're very sparingly ornamented. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the main gate is the same, has little to no ornamentation. Uh, Force perspective is used to make the building appear larger than it actually is. So those battlements at the top are too small to be used for actual cover. Um, these, uh, the walls are only 30 feet high, uh, which is the same size as the row houses that now surround the prison. But they still appear to tower overhead. It's really hard to give a good sense of the scale of this prison without seeing it in person. It, it is a big chungus. Um... So the Gothic style Haviland picked was more reminiscent of a church or a castle than a prison. And that was to emphasize the focus on penitence. Uh, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but this building is meant to intimidate. This building is meant to say, if you wind up here, you will not have a good time. Next slide, please. Uh, inside, we see a very different story of extremely utilitarian buildings for an extremely utilitarian purpose. And that's where we're going to step away from the architecture history and talk about how Eastern State Penitentiary functioned. Now, the term penitentiary is important here. These facilities were supposed to make inmates do penance for their crimes. The way this was achieved was through the Pennsylvania system, or the separate system. Uh, this system arose from advocacy from the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons. So the basic idea behind the separate system was simple. Prisoners were completely separated from each other at all times. Uh, you were held in solitary confinement. Uh, if you had to be moved through the facility, you wore a hood while doing so. Uh, no interactions between prisoners was allowed at all, and prisoners couldn't even see each other. Um, because prisoners were intended to spend the entirety of their sentence inside their cell, Cells were pretty generously proportioned. Uh, most of them were 12 feet long and 8 feet wide, and they each had an individual 16-foot by 8-foot private exercise yard. That's, uh, you know, that's more square footage than a fair amount of studio apartments, and much larger than most prison cells today. Um, 
To minimize the need for prisoners to interact with guards, cells were equipped with the latest technology. They had radiator heating and flush toilets. Um, cells were laid out along long radial corridors with all the corridors visible from a central guard post. You might notice that this is the same basic layout that most modern prisons have, as well as a lot of urban high schools built in the 1960s and 70s. That's another topic for another day, though. Uh, there were some panopticon-like features that were included. Um, for instance, the guards wore special slippers to prevent their movement through corridors from being heard by the prisoners. Um, while there were no doors to the cells from the interior corridors, there were peepholes through which the guards could observe the prisoners, as well as small openings through which you could pass food and drink. Um, so as a result, if you were in the cell, it was very difficult to know when you were being watched. So theoretically, you had to be on your best behavior at all times. Now, this was the largest and most advanced building in the entire country. Central heating and flush toilets were unheard of. Uh, not even the White House had central heating or flush toilets. Haviland was a relatively inexperienced architect, so several methods had to be tried before radiator heat was settled on as the most effective heating. Other methods he tried gave uh, prisoners carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, so we've now built the largest structure in the new nation for the sake of imprisonment. Who's incarcerated there? Uh, as the Eastern State Penitentiary, anyone sentenced to a prison term in the eastern half of the state was to be sent there, at least in theory. In practice, a lot of counties preferred to construct their own small jails rather than sharing the cost of maintaining Eastern State. In addition, with no federal prison yet constructed, anyone found guilty of federal crimes was often sent to Eastern State. In the first years of its operation, uh, nearly one quarter of the prisoners were black, whereas uh, in Philadelphia as a whole, uh, only 8% of the population was non-white of any kind. Uh, it's in 1830. That's the best census I could find. While you were in the facility, you were typically only referred to by your inmate number and not your name. Inmates were numbered sequentially, starting from inmate number one. So as I mentioned before, inmates were confined individually in cells they were not intended to leave for the length of their sentence. Sentences could be up to 21 years long, but in practice, most were two years or less. Uh, unlike modern solitary confinement, however, uh, a guard was required to talk to every prisoner every day, and uh, sometimes there'd be visits from the clergy or from the Philadelphia Prison Society. Uh, you weren't allowed to have visits from family and friends, though. Furthermore, while confined individually, prisoners were still able to work. Now, there was a healthy debate, uh, even in the early 19th century, about whether or not prison labor was ethical or if it was preferable to have prisoners uh, sit idle, um, but state law put an end to that debate. Prisoners at Eastern State Penitentiary had to work. When you arrived at Eastern State, after they let you stew in the cell a few days, the guards would give you some task or trade you could perform, you know, to pass the time. They'd say it was a favor, but basically every prisoner was expected to work. So a lot of folks were shoemakers or did some form of textile work, and, uh, you know, this was supposed to help the prison to pay its own way, but it very rarely did so. Uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, so, uh, again, this is, uh, though it's solitary confinement, it's not as extreme as modern solitary confinement is. Uh... And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to Philosophy Tube. Uh, he, he's got a good, good video on solitary confinement. Uh, now, okay, so this is one of the most complete and total uses of architecture to subjugate human beings in history, up to this point at least. Did it work? Eh, not really. There weren't enough guards to prevent prisoners in adjacent cells from communicating, right? Uh, when prisoners were let out for exercise, sometimes they could yell to the person two cells over, uh, and prisoners tapped out messages on radiator pipes, and, you know, they surreptitiously slipped each other messages. And one enterprising prisoner put a hole in his wall to talk to the guy next door. 
So the separate system didn't really catch on for the simple reason that its fanatical devotion to solitary confinement precluded prisoners from doing communal labor, and it took up a lot of real estate. Uh, in contrast, in the Auburn system, or the New York system, prisoners worked together in silence. This eventually supplanted the separate system, since communal prison labor could make a prison more self-sustaining, and it was uh, easier for outside firms and industries to employ prisoners for their needs. Also, it allowed for much smaller cells. Um, uh, the separate system where many individuals worked alone simply couldn't compete with industrialized mass production, which was possible in other prisons or even outside the prison. Now, furthermore, uh, organized labor was opposed to prison labor. You know, prison labor undercut fair wages, and furthermore, you know, prison labor is bad. Now, back in the early 19th century, there's less of a theoretical or philosophical opposition to prison labor uh, like we have now. Uh, these early unions just didn't like that prisons could undercut their wages. So organized labor organized against prison labor. Now, in the Auburn system, with its outside contractors, big business was on the side of the prison labor system, and by and large, the prison workhouses kept humming. However, at Eastern State Penitentiary, there were no outside contractors. All material was bought by the prison, all instructions in the trades was taught by the prison, and all the sales of finished goods were conducted by the prison. And uh, unlike big business... The prison administration was at least nominally accountable to the people, you know, through, uh, through the state government. So organized labor was fairly effective at keeping eastern state prisoners from laboring in communal workhouses for a long time, until the end of the 19th century. Uh, as a result, the products of prison labor at eastern state penitentiary produced individually simply weren't competitive with factory-made or union-made products. And in fact, the separate system at Eastern State Penitentiary broke down very quickly as prisoners were recruited to work in and around the prison, which necessarily required them to see other prisoners and guards. Uh, the prison exceeded its maximum capacity briefly before it was even completed. That's why three of the cell blocks are one story while the remaining four have two stories. Haviland had to alter the design while construction was underway to meet the needs of the legal system. By 1865, having a cellmate became the norm. Uh, eventually, the private exercise yards were converted into workhouses, and effectively the separate system was no more. And Eastern State would be modified many, many times to increase its capacity in ways that further compromised the separate system, which would only officially be abandoned in the 20th century. It would continue operating as a prison until the 1970s. Um... Today, it still fulfills one of its original roles, which was as a tourist attraction. After it was completed, it was the second most visited site in the United States, losing out only to Niagara Falls. Uh, people flocked from around the country to see this newer, supposedly more humane method of punishment or penitence. Today, it's a preserved ruin that you can visit and take an audio tour of, uh, narrated by Steve Buscemi. I recommend it. It's a good time. So, this episode was about prisons, or a specific prison, in 1836, but I think it's important to ask the question, what legacy did the separate system leave us with? And has the separate system had an effect on the functioning of prisons today in modern capitalist society? Now, again, this is not my area of expertise, but I do find it interesting how modern prison labor is used extensively in industries where automation is difficult and driving down wages is hard. So, to lower production costs, capitalists employ prison labor for tasks like picking crops, industrial meatpacking, building pre-assembled furniture, uh, running call centers, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the end, the large-scale industrial prison workhouse has been supplanted by large numbers of prisoners working menial jobs individually. Um, mass incarceration is effectively used as a sort of internal outsourcing, replacing high-paid free workers 
with prisoners required to work for pennies, if indeed they're paid at all. Uh, long prison sentences for trivial and nonviolent offenses, you know, smoking a joint, failure to pay a fine, and so on, uh, these all have a purpose. They uh, feed the beast to global capitalism. These prison workers can't strike, they can't demand raises, they can't talk back, and in fact, you know, they have nothing to do other than work. Prison systems are aware of this and, in fact, advertise it while trying to contract out their captive labor force. And like in the separate system, prison labor is still sold as a privilege to prisoners, though in most cases it's still all but mandatory. So in that sense, some characteristics of the separate system remain. However, it's in a much more highly regimented, capitalistic, and punitive form and the Pennsylvania Society for the Alleviating of the Miseries of Public Prisons could have ever imagined. Right, so that was the Law and Order episode. Here's the commercial. Uh, so, we'll kind of skip February with content. Sorry about that. Uh, my landlord's been doing some construction in the basement, and the apartment's been kind of unusable recently, and uh, I'll be damned if I go to one of those co-working places. I, you know, I'd be seeking venture capital money for my new socialism app in hours if I went to one of those places. Uh, anyway, so if you're unhappy that the content faucet's been turned off for a bit, then I have a few recommendations for where you can put your money instead of my Patreon. So, first off, since we were talking about prisons today, guess who's back in prison? That's right, Chelsea Manning. Uh, so the thing is that while we have a bunch of rights and regular trials in the United States, once a grand jury is involved, the legal system just turns into Calvin Ball. So uh, Chelsea Manning's Legal Defense Fund is accepting donations. Please help get her out of the clink. That link is going to be in the description. Uh, you can also donate to the victims of the recent Christchurch massacre by that white supremacist guy. Uh, that link is also in the description. So if for some reason you still have confidence in my ability to deliver content, you can donate to my Patreon. A dollar a month gets you bonus episodes that appear... Uh, occasionally. The one on Killdozer is already up. The next one's going to be on the Boston Molasses Disaster. After that, I don't know where we're going. I need some ideas. Uh, furthermore, thanks to all y'all supporters, we finally used the power of postmodern cultural Marxism to shame the lobster guy off of Patreon. I'm just going to go ahead and take, take the credit for that one. Uh, definitely no other factors involved there. So I guess we need a new right-wing guy to Marx culturally in a postmodern fashion. I don't know, maybe PewDiePie or Notch or someone. Let me know in the comments. Uh, if you don't want to support me monthly, then throw me a dollar on buymeacoffee.com. So I'm not going to spend the money on coffee. I'm going to spend it on beer. That link is also in the description. Uh, you can follow me on the Twitter at do not eat one or on the Mastodon at do not eat at mastodon.social though I'm not very active there. Also, check out my Steam Workshop, where the Eastern State Penitentiary model is. And the mod list is up, finally. That's in the description. Okay, now we're going to do the cinematics. <laughs>